to see uh, a lot of new faces and several of people that I'm very, very familiar with too. Very appreciative of the fact you've taken time on such a beautiful evening to come out and be with us here tonight. Uh, I've been asked by Secretary Bowen of the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs, the agency that operates this facility, to extend his greetings to you and to uh, let you know that the Department of Veterans Affairs is very happy that you're taking advantage of the programs that we have to offer. Wisconsin Veterans Museum, you know, has been in business at, in this site now for 10 years. I like to think that we are ver a very enterprising small operation and that we take advantage of opportunities as they arise. And tonight is an example of that very phenomenon. We had the opportunity to partner with the George Mossy program at the, University, at the Department of History, the University of Wisconsin, to bring to your attention a very, very rare treat. And uh, that, to me, shows uh, that we're on our toes and that we're using enterprise and, and to take advantage of opportunities as they come about. With these kind of partnerships, and we've had several others in the past, we can make available uh, programs that we might not otherwise have the opportunity to do. So tonight we have the opportunity to present for you a major scholar, uh, uh, John Gaddis of Yale University, who is going to talk tonight about the war, current events, the war in Iraq, in which we are we're not as fast as we'd like to be, and we are just now organizing a program on the modern Middle East and, and the war with Iraq, which will be ready, if we're lucky, in March. So tonight is kind of a foreshadowing of that, uh, taking advantage of fast-moving events, trying to stay up on our toes, and these international activities that swirl around us uh, uh, encourage us to plan for the future, but uh, it's, it's, as one of the generals said, it's, a, it's very hard to talk about history when you're talking about the war in Iraq because it just ended three weeks ago or so. It's very fast. In sum, we're glad you came. We'd like to uh, say that Wisconsin Veterans Museum takes advantage of its small budget, limited budget, limited staff, and an enthusiastic audience to present to you and will continue to present to you programs that we hope that will be of your interest. I want to introduce uh, Professor Jeremy Suri of the University of Wisconsin Department of History, and he's going to introduce our speaker tonight, John Gaddis. There'll be time for questions and answers afterwards, as well as the desire to fill out your evaluations, because that's how we operate. Thanks. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming. It's really a great pleasure uh, to be here tonight. I think this is a great example of how uh, the university can reach out to the larger community and the larger community can reach out to the university. It seems to me we haven't done enough of that in the past and Rich, Rich Zeitlin here at the Veterans Museum has probably been better at doing that than anyone else, at least judging by the events I've been invited to. They always seem to have interesting speakers, fun discussions, and often interesting food to eat also. <laughs> we didn't have that tonight. No, it's not. <laughs> um, um, but I think actually this is a model for more of what we should be doing, uh, especially in these lean budgetary times. And so I really want to thank Richard for uh, inviting us here. I want to thank uh, the George Mossy Fund at the University of Wisconsin. I want to thank the History Department, uh, John Cooper and others in particular who helped to organize this. It's really, a, a, it's really wonderful to be able to do this in an environment in which we'll have students, some of my own undergrads I see sitting here. I'll remember this when I grade, which you grade in a little <laughs> while. And others from the larger community. It's really, it really is, it really is, I think, that the model for how we should do this kind of thing. It also is a wonderful um, environment in which to introduce John Gaddis, because unlike any other historian I know, John Gaddis has worked hard throughout his career to break down the boundaries, I think, between academic history and the thinking and work of policymakers and ordinary citizens interested in historical as we all are when we grapple with events like the current uh, situation in the Middle East. John Gaddis' scholarship, uh, really uniquely among historians of the Cold War, has reached not only historians and political scientists, but intelligent, ordinary citizens. Has really, I think, had a positive influence upon the way we view the period. Uh, certainly my undergrads who have been forced to read his work, I hope, will, will attest to that. They better on their final exams. <laughs> Um, and I think that is, again, the kind of model for the sort of historical work we should all do. Today, John is going to talk to us about contemporary affairs in the Middle East, in particular about the Bush administration's national, national security strategy 
And again, I think this is an example of how historical knowledge can be relevant for how we evaluate present events, how we evaluate our current situation, not just in the Middle East, but as a state, as a society, grappling with the after effects of 9-11, grappling with new threats overseas, grappling with a new war we've just fought, possibly accomplished certain aims on the ground, but still have a lot before us in terms of reconstructing Iraq, and also a new kind of world, a new post-Cold War situation. John today will bring historical knowledge to bear upon these events, and I hope we can all take a lot from this. It's also my pleasure to introduce John because I think he is someone who has done a lot, not only to bring historical knowledge to our field, but also to train a new generation of people to think about these issues, and I'm, I'm one of them, and I'm very proud to introduce John in those terms. So please, let's all uh, give John a round of applause. Today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Richard. Thanks to uh, the museum and the Masi program as well for making this possible. And thanks again, and a lot of thanks this evening, but thanks again to all of you for coming out. Um, I want to talk, I want to slightly amend actually the title. The title tonight was billed as uh, Surprise Security and the American Experience, and that indeed will be the title of the forthcoming book. Um, but rather than go through um, a, a summary, of what that book is about. It really does go back to the, uh, the first surprise attack in American history, the British burning of Washington in 1814 and the consequences that flowed from that, as well as Pearl Harbor 1941. I thought tonight uh, everyone, including me, would be more interested in talking about what has just happened, what we have just uh, lived through. I think it has been, over the last year and a half or so, one of the most surprising periods in our own history indeed in the history of the modern world. And to illustrate this point, let me simply invite you retroactively to where my wife, Tony, and I actually were on the evening of September the 10th, 2001. We were at a cookout for the Yale Grand Strategy students at Professor Paul Kennedy's beach house on Long Island Sound. And let's assume you're there as we were on that evening. And let's further assume that a particularly far-sighted student of grand strategy comes up to you, uh, a can of beer in hand, and whispers the following into your ear. First, that the United States was about to suffer the most devastating terrorist attack ever on its own soil. Second, that it would respond quickly to that attack by invading and easily conquering the nation that any historian could have told you would have been the most resistant to invasion and conquest of Afghanistan, and that the United States would have the support of the Afghan people, for the most part, and of most of the rest of the world uh, in doing so. Third, that the United States would, over the next few months, undertake the most sweeping reassessment. Uh, Natalie has already taken your second part. <laughs> That the United States would, over the next few months, undertake the most sweeping reassessment of American national security strategy in over half a century, and that it would uh, publish the results of this rethinking for all to read, to discuss, and to dissent from, as indeed the Bush administration did with its published national security strategy of uh, September of 2002. That the United States would then, in a manner consistent with that publicly expressed strategy, seek the approval of its allies and the United Nations Security Council for what it regarded as the next logical step in implementing this new grand strategy, that is, going after Saddam Hussein's Iraq, and that it would fail miserably in getting that international approval from the United Nations and from many, though not all, of course, of its own allies. That the United States would then nonetheless with the help of a coalition of powerful states, including Britain, Poland, and Micronesia, <laughs> go ahead and attack Iraq anyway, in the face of the direst warnings about the risk of that operation in terms of potential military resistance from the Iraqis, the danger of the use of weapons of mass destruction, the prospect of an eruption of outrage throughout the Arab world, the danger of a new outbreak of terrorism, the possibility of a huge increase in the price of oil, uh, 
and the prospect uh, of overall astronomical estimates uh, in the overall costs of this operation, that the United States would go ahead and face of all of these pessimistic predict predictions of what was going to happen, none of which would come true. And that among the effects of this operation would be the withdrawal of American forces from Saudi Arabia, the initiation, as we saw just today, of secret discussions between the United States and the Iranians, looking forward to the establishment of diplomatic relations, the revival of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, an increasingly cooperative Syria, uh, and uh, a surprisingly quiet North Korea, whose leader, as we have also discovered just today, unaccountably disappeared from view uh, for the two months or so that this operation uh, was going on. And what are the other great powers? The French, the Germans, the Russians, the Chinese. But I think the best one can say is that they are shaking their heads in some perplexity over what has happened, perhaps even in the case of some of them in some alarm. Because what has happened is the clear emergence of the United States as a far more powerful and purposeful actor in world politics than it was on September the 10th, 2001. And they are no doubt, as most of the rest of us are as well, shaking our heads in some perplexity over the most amazing transformation of an underrated national leader since Prince Hal became Henry V. <laughs> I think if anybody had predicted this course of events some uh, uh, 18 or 19 months ago on what we can now see to have been uh, the last evening of the post-Cold War era, that's what September the 10th, 2001 actually was, where in the next morning we entered a new era, as yet unnamed. If anybody had made these predictions to you, and particularly if it had been a Yale grand strategy student who had come up and whispered this in your ear, you would have wondered what they'd been drinking or what pills they'd been popping or what weed they might have been smoking. You certainly would not have taken them seriously in this prediction. And yet, here we are. All of this has happened uh, in this last 18 to 19 months. So how do we make some sense of all of this? What do we know now that we didn't know back then? What's going to be said in the future about these first years of the 21st century? What's going to be the take on it by historians 20 years out, 50 years out, perhaps 100 years out? But I must confess to you, I hope you're not disappointed, I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> Any good historian will warn you of the dangers of prediction, of trying to use the recent past as a lens through which to try to see the future. It's a highly dangerous and problematic enterprise. And yet, I think there are a few things that we can say now with somewhat greater certainty than we could have said on that terrible morning of September 11, 2001. Or even on March the 19th, 2003, the date that a war began that has now, as Richard uh, indicated, very quickly ended. Perhaps the best way to attempt this would indeed be to go back and to review some of the most important criticisms that were made of the decision to go to war in Iraq. There was a remarkably long period of time for debate over this war. You could see it coming for a long time, and it was full and free and vigorous debate. But I think it might be useful to go back and review some of the criticisms that were made of this decision to see how well they hold up now. I will do this uh, in what Jeremy knows to be my normal manner, which is slightly forthright with a view to trying to generate uh, discussion, which I hope uh, will follow. Uh, please remember, as I do so, that you'll have the chance to come back at me, I hope, equally forthrightly in the discussion period uh, that is to follow. So let me start with the first and most basic criticism that was made of the decision for war in Iraq, emanating as it did from certain sectors of the peace movement. And that was the criticism which we've heard before of other wars that war never solves anything, and that therefore the use of force is never justifiable. I think this is simply not true. Here is a list of issues that have been resolved by the use of force by Americans over the past several hundred years. 
few of which very many of us would now question. They would include American independence itself, the securing of our national boundaries, the end of slavery, the defeat of Imperial Germany in World War I, the eradication of German and Japanese totalitarianism in World War II, the preservation of South Korea in 1950-53, the liberation of Kuwait in 1991, the pacification of Bosnia in 1995, the rescue of Kosovo in 1999, the overthrow of the Taliban in Afghanistan in 2001, and now most recently the elimination of one of the most odious authoritarian regimes anywhere, that of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Now, of course, there have been other wars with more ambiguous and less defensible outcomes. Our own wars with Mexico in 1846 and Spain in uh, 1898 would certainly fall into that category. And so, too, quite arguably, with the war in Vietnam, uh, about which debate still rages and will rage uh, for a very long time. It's also true that even decisive and morally justifiable wars don't solve everything. Nothing in history ever solves everything, which is why there's more and more history all the time, which is why there are more and more historians to write about in the first place. But it does seem to me that the premise that we would be better off never using force seems to me not to hold water for the simple reason that I think if we had followed that path in the past with the consistency that its advocates have recommended, we would not be here tonight doing what we're doing. A second criticism that was made of the decision for war in Iraq was that, well, okay, some wars are justifiable, but this particular war was not. The logic here depends on the notion uh, that while there is an inherent right to respond with military force when one is attacked, as in the war of American independence, or as in the Civil War, or as in World War II, or Korea, or the first Gulf War, or even the war against the Taliban, who had, after all, harbored Osama bin Laden and the perpetrators of the 9-11 attack. Even though there is the inherent right to attack or to respond when attacked, uh, Iraq was different because Iraq hadn't attacked anybody, at least not recently. That argument depends, though, it seems to me, on a somewhat outdated understanding of threats to national security and how they arise. For the past several hundred years, the danger of a devastating attack could only arise from the actions of hostile states with substantial military capabilities. And because these states were, for the most part, visible, because the authorities that controlled them were, for the most part, rational, they could normally be contained and, if necessary, deterred by building up countervailing capabilities. But September 11th, uh, very clearly, I think, revealed a new kind of threat, the possibility that gangs using weapons of mass destruction, or even using weapons that had never been considered to be weapons before, but which achieved mass destruction in the way in which they were used, could attain levels of damage that only states had been capable of perpetrating in the past. We lost uh, 2,200 people from the attack of a state that was well known to us on December the 7th. We lost 3,000 people on September 11, 2001, from the actions of a gang of whose existence most of us were completely unaware until the moment of the attack itself. And I think we face, as a consequence, a new situation in which containment and deterrence are not enough. Because how do you contain somebody who is invisible? How do you deter somebody who is prepared to commit suicide? And that, of course, is where the Bush administration's new strategy of preemption comes in. Their argument is that we have to try to anticipate where such strikes might come from in the future and prevent them from ever taking place because the consequences of not doing that could be so horrendous uh, that that risk simply cannot be run. Okay, we might argue, accept that argument. But then there's the fact that Saddam Hussein was not the person who attacked us on September 11th. It was not his gang that did this in the first place. Al-Qaeda did. And there's still no evidence that Iraq had anything to do with that atrocity. Nor, up to this point, have we confirmed the presence 
of the widely advertised weapons of mass destruction, which provided one of the reasons that the administration cited for going to war with Iraq in the first place. And all of that is true enough from what we know now. But the Bush administration has not been content simply with punishing uh, or preempting the perpetrators of September 11th. It is moving beyond that to seek to change the circumstances that caused 9-11 to happen. And I think that's where the real justification for the war in Iraq uh, comes in. Those circumstances that led to the 9-11 attack, it's now fairly clear, were not poverty or injustice, for the hijackers were, for the most part, educated, mostly middle class, uh, mostly Saudis. Uh, there's an emerging consensus even within the Arab world itself these days that the causes of terrorism lie rather in the, per in the persistence of authoritarian regimes in that part of the world. Authoritarian regimes that allow no other outlet for dissent, whether against themselves or against the United States, other than through terrorist acts. And it follows from this then that the existence of authoritarian regimes themselves poses a threat to our national security and to that of other democracies elsewhere. Saddam Hussein's was the most authoritarian regime in the Middle East. It was also the regime with the least amount of legitimacy because of its <coughs> atrocities against its own people, because of its uh, attacks on both Iran and Kuwait, because of its refusal to respect repeated United Nations resolutions requiring it uh, to disarm. And so the argument here is that even without the link, even without the smoking gun that would connect the Iraqi regime with 9-11, even without uh, uh, a confirmed weapons of mass destruction capability, there was a strong case for acting against Iraq after the Taliban, uh, the Iraqis, the Saddam Hussein regime, was the next big target on the list. But OK, you might respond to that criticism, sure. But some of our allies also in that part of the world also are authoritarian. Why aren't we attacking our authoritarian allies in that part of the world? I think the answer here, although this has not been widely advertised by the administration for obvious reasons, I think the answer here is that indeed we are attacking our authoritarian allies in that part of the world, though by different means and in different ways and on a different schedule, certainly not necessarily with exclusively military means. I include among our authoritarian allies Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Pakistan, and I would even include Israel, at least in its occupation of the Palestinian territories. And it seems to me that the Bush strategy is aimed at all of these targets in one way or another, certainly not all at once, certainly not by the same means, but that is the direction in which things are going. The idea is that if you can establish some semblance of democracy in a place like Iraq, in a major Arab state like Iraq, the effects of this are going to ripple through the region and encourage reform elsewhere. It will become apparent that Muslims, like everybody else, want to leave, leave their lives free from oppression and that the path to liberty for them, as it has been for so many other cultures and peoples over the last 100 years, lies through democracy. Military force will not be necessary in all of these instances, the administration believes. In many instances, the force of example alone will suffice. But then wait a minute, you might say. You just lumped the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory under your heading of authoritarianism as well. Are you arguing that the Bush strategy is aimed at ending that as well? And I think it is in several different ways, some of which have become apparent just in the last couple of weeks or so. First of all, our victory in Iraq has already made the democratic state of Israel uh, more secure, no more prospect of scud launches from Iraqi territory, no more subsidies for the families of suicide bombers from uh, Saddam Hussein. Secondly, the Bush administration, unlike any of its predecessors, has called explicitly for the formation of a Palestinian state. And it's now presented the long-awaited internationally co-sponsored roadmap laying out that process. And third, however, the administration also demands 
that this new Palestinian state itself be democratic, uh, hence its refusal to deal with Yasser Arafat. With the re recent election of Mahmoud Abbas as Palestinian uh, Prime Minister, there is interesting progress on that front uh, as well. So can this work? Can this plan for an Israeli-Palestinian settlement actually work? I don't know, but there is, uh, there are interesting things that are going on. The evidence of a new, the emergence of a new generation of Palestinian leaders who may be prepared to reject the failed policies of their elders. I think it's highly significant that the crisis in Iraq appears to have pushed that process along rather than retarding that process. And I think it's also significant that Prime Minister Sharon has now acknowledged that Israel may have to make, as he's put it, painful concessions on the settlements in the occupied territories. I think it would be, in fact, I know it would be utterly foolish to try to predict with any certainty what's going to happen in this situation. But I will venture this much, that the vision of the Bush administration is indeed one in which an Israeli model takes hold throughout the Middle East. But the model that the administration has in mind is not that of military occupation or of militant Zionism or of some secret program hatched by Jewish neoconservatives in Washington think tanks. <coughs> the model the administration has in mind, rather, is that of a firmly rooted democratic system of government, which alone among Middle Eastern states, Israelis currently enjoy. Others in the region, the administration believes, should enjoy this as well. I think that's the direction of the administration's thinking. There is another assumption that lies as well behind this strategy, though, and it's this, that it cannot be, help, it cannot be healthy for Israeli democracy to have to continue indefinitely an authoritarian occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Now, that has to end, too, and it has to end on terms that ensure Israeli security, as well as the future of a democratic Palestinian state. And that's another sense, it seems to me, in which the promotion of democracy in the Middle East really is part of the administration's strategy. Well, OK, you might argue, grant that much. But the administration's motives are not what they seem to be. They may talk about democracy, but it's really all about oil. Well, this is the charge perhaps most frequently made against American policy in the Middle East, despite the obvious evidence against it. For if our policy had been about oil all of these years, why would, why would we so strongly have supported Israel, which has none in the first place over the last half century or more? And of course, the answer is that the motives of the American government in the Middle East, like the motives of most governments, like the motives of most individuals, are mixed. Oil is part of the picture, of course, but so too is security. And this administration has concluded that the path to security in that part of the world actually lies through the promotion of democracy. This administration is unusual in being a conservative government that is actually optimistic about human nature. It's even more unusual in the sense that it draws its greatest ideological inspiration, not from Adam Smith or Edmund Burke, but from Woodrow Wilson. This is a real breakthrough for conservatives uh, in this country. How can this be, you may argue, isn't this administration riddled with cynicism? Not as much, it seems to me, as are many of its critics. But if that's true, what about multilateralism? The Bush, National, the Bush National strategy statement stressed the need to act in concert with allies. But of course, the Bush administration wound up, for the most part, not doing so, acting unilaterally. How come this happened? Well, partly I think it happened because of the administration's own clumsy diplomacy. It's difficult to get other sovereign states to cooperate with you on some things, like the war in Iraq, when you're busy telling them on other things, like the Kyoto Treaty or the International Criminal Court or the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, to shut it. And that was certainly part of the problem. Part of the problem also, though, I think, was shock and awe on the part of much of the rest of the world over the fact, the astonishing fact, that the United States now at last has a coherent 
post Cold War and grand strategy. There's never been any question about our power in the post Cold War world, but there was plenty of reason to wonder during the 1990s whether we knew what to do with that power. That indecisiveness may well have given rise, at least in part, to the mistaken judgment on the part of bin Laden and his gang that they can engage in an escalating pattern of terrorism and get away with it. Now they know they can't, and of course it's good for them to know that. But the process of making that point clear has startled other allies whose indecisiveness and lack of attention to matters of national security exceeds even our own record in the 1990s. The result has been that states like Germany and France have suddenly begun to notice that their power these days lies more in the coddling of farmers and the cultivation of labor unions than in the projection of military or political influence. And this has led uh, them, or at least some people in the leaderships of those countries, the weird conclusion that the gravest threat they now face is from the Americans, not from the terrorists or those who support them. This will pass, I think. They will, in time, get over this, most likely when a terrorist attack occurs on their own soil, and they face what we faced on 9-11. Now, what about the United Nations? Well, the Bush administration did attempt, indeed, to use that organization through the fall of 2002 and the winter of 2002-03, and for a time, it did so effectively. Does anybody think that Hans Blick and his inspectors would have made it into Iraq in the first place if it had not been for Bush's uh, speech to the UN on September 12, 2002, challenging that organization to live up to its own obligations? The UN's failure, uh, it seems to me, came when the French, with their own peculiar logic, made it clear that they would now use their veto to prevent the resolution they had earlier voted for from now being implemented. And this led the United States with only two, left the United States with only two choices. It could trust French assurances that we could trust Saddam Hussein, or it could act along with its allies apart from the UN, as the charter of that organization indeed allows its members to do when their interests are in danger. Well, wait a minute, you might say. Uh, this has all gone too far. Because we all know that George W. Bush is the ultimate lightweight, quite, person, quite possibly the last person ever to have earned a C at Yale University. <laughs> How could somebody like that come up with the kind of heavyweight strategy that you could have described tonight? But I would simply point out, in answer to this question, that with just a couple of exceptions, the American presidents regarded as most successful in framing and implementing coherent strategies during and after World War II were all of them, or at least they appeared to be, intellectual lightweights. I would include among their number Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Harry S. Truman, Dwight E. Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, and now George W. Bush, who understands, as all of these predecessors did, that it's more important to keep the entire picture in view than to master specific details of it in a policy wonkish way. And it's better to start with low expectations and impress rather than to begin with high expectations and disappoint. And what are the heavyweights who have failed as grand strategies? Well, my list here would include Lyndon Johnson for obvious reasons, Vietnam. I would include that Richard Nixon, not so much for his foreign policy, which I think did largely succeed, or for his domestic self-destruction. I would include uh, Jimmy Carter. I would include George H. W. Bush for the failure to follow through on the victory in the Gulf and for the failure to, uh, again, uh, avoid domestic um, self-destruction in that situation. And I would certainly include Bill Clinton. His grand strategy consisted, as far as I can tell, uh, simply in the notion that uh, we must expand uh, the uh, role of market capitalism in the world and enlarge the prospects for democracy in the world, phenomena which he believed were so firmly rooted that they were happening anyway and were inevitable. Therefore, one wonders why it was necessary to have a grand strategy in the first place. And Clinton himself is on record having wondered this. His aide, Strobe Talbot, in his new memoir, describes a conversation with President Clinton at some point in 1994, in which Clinton 
one of these late at night musings with his advisors says to Talbot, these guys, Roosevelt and Truman, they didn't have grand strategies, did they? We don't need one either, do we? And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> so, does this mean yeah, that the qualities of mind, we academics, uh, we academics who are here in this room, not everybody in the room obviously is an academic, the qualities of mind we academics look for and appreciate in our lecture halls, in our seminar rooms, in our departmental meetings, may not be those best attuned to the running of national and international grand strategy. I know that this is an astounding concept, but I feel like I have embraced them. That, um, that might be far too controversial a question for me to answer myself tonight, so let me just leave that up to you. Let me leave that one hanging out there, and perhaps we can come back to it in the question period. I want to conclude by just saying a few words about what I think all this means for the Iraqis for the Middle East, for the United States, and for the world. I think the Iraqis have made it reasonably clear in recent days what they think it means for them. They did, in the end, welcome us. They do see the prospects of a better life. It's by no means perfect. The conditions they have now are really, in some ways, quite horrendous. But there is at least the hope and the prospect that these will improve in ways that did not exist when they lived under Saddam Hussein. So the hope, at least, is there. And in raising that hope, and in manifesting that welcome, the Iraqis have thereby confirmed what most of us knew already, which is that freedom is a universal value, not a culturally determined value, or even a socially constructed value. Life may not be good for the Iraqis for some time to come, but as a result of the actions of the United States and its coalition partners, there's every reason to think it's going to be better, as it also has been, though not perfect, for the Afghans uh, as well as a result of what happened in 2001. For the Middle East, the war in Iraq could well be the catalyst that sets in motion a movement toward reform, toward filling the democratic deficit in that part of the world, toward bringing that part of the world along with everybody else into the modern age. I would be the first to say, and I see skeptical eyebrows being raised around the room already, I would be the first to say there are no guarantees here. Um, one of the paradoxes of democratic government is that it can, under certain circumstances, produce undemocratic results. Anybody who knows German history would know this possibility. That's the risk, though, that we have to run. And it seems to me the fact that democratic governance can go wrong is no reason not to promote democratic governance, nonetheless, as the best alternative that's out there, given what we know and what we experience. Um, the administration certainly is gambling that this huge gamble that it has embarked on of trying to democratize the Middle East is actually less of a gamble, less, and less of a risk, and allowing the status quo in the Middle East to continue, because we all had painful evidence on September 11, 2001, what the status quo in the Middle East actually meant for us. I think we also just have to hold out in the back of our minds what another September 11 would mean for us and for the rest of the world. Uh, our society, if you think our society changed dramatically as a result of September 11th, 2001, factor in one more such attack, and then ask yourself, how much would our society change? I think it would change a lot, not for the good. And it seems to me that this raises the prospect of the danger of the status quo being allowed simply to continue, and I think puts the risks that we are running and the enormous gamble that we are taking in the Middle East into a slightly different perspective perhaps a more justifiable one. For the United States, the war in Iraq presents us with the task of trying to transplant democracy into a part of the world where it has never really existed. A totally impossible task, you might argue, until you remember that, of course, we did just this in Germany and Japan half a century ago, and that the example we set there has spread to almost all parts of the world except the Middle East. You can very well say, well, Iraq is not Germany and Japan, but there were plenty of people who said Germany and Japan were not hospitable territory for uh, a democratic government, certainly not Japan, which had never you know, at that time. So who's to say what is possible and what is not? Change does occur in history. Institutions, cultures do evolve in history. A costly task, you may say. 
but note that the costs so far, both in economic and human terms, have come in far, far below the most optimistic estimates of the critics of the war before its outbreak. Our Yale colleague, uh, Bill Nordhouse, in the economics department, was projecting costs running somewhere up in the neighborhood of $500 billion for this war uh, in the months uh, and weeks preceding its outbreak. Uh, the costs that I've seen so far are somewhere slightly above uh, $20 billion rising to 30 billion or something like that, nowhere near the estimates uh, that were being projected. A non-sustainable task, you may say, given the notoriously short attention span of the American people, who don't have the ability to focus on anything for much more than five minutes or so, except that I would point out that, of course, the United States, the American people, sustained our international commitment, strategy of containment, through some four and a half decades of the Cold War and beyond, far better record than anybody else achieved in the last half of the 20th century, and we can probably sustain peace. For the war, uh, for the world at large, the war in Iraq, it has been argued, could mean the rise of a new imperialism, because not since Rome has a single state wielded so much power. And that's true enough, too. But it's worth recalling some of the reasons that empires have arisen in the past, in the first place. These include greed and ambition and arrogance, uh, to be sure, but they also include the need to provide security, to combat anarchy, to uh, deal with the problems of failed states, to spread values, not all of which necessarily, in all instances, constrain liberty. Some of these values may actually enhance the prospects uh, for liberty. But what about hubris, you might argue? What about arrogance? What about the phenomenon my colleague Kennedy has so often and so eloquently described as imperial overstretch? And I argue about these things across the backyard that we share uh, in New Haven uh, fairly often. Uh, there is, in my view, not the slightest reason to believe that Americans are immune from these viruses, are exempt from these tendencies. The claim that we were exempt or immune from them be to suggest that we exist apart from history, rather than within history, and that would be silly. But I think where Americans can claim some distinctiveness is in the fact that our imperial presence, or our hegemony, if you prefer to use that term, has on the whole generated less resistance uh, than that of any other great empire since the earliest days of Rome. The greatest strength of the American empire in the past here I'm extending the history of the American Empire back through uh, the immediate aftermath of World War II, because hegemony is no new thing. We have enjoyed this since 1945, basically. It seems to me that uh, the American Empire, um, the strength of the American Empire, has not lain in its military or economic or ideological capabilities, though these have been important, the great strength of the American Empire in the past half century lain in our ability to persuade others to want pretty much the same things that we do. We did that by linking our particular practices to universal principles, so that even the things we did out of self-interest could appear to be, and often were, uh, in the pursuit of a larger collective interest. Uh, that, I think, is what has most been lost in the current uh, approaches of this administration, and this is where I would primarily fault them is the inattention that they have given to the perpetuation of that secret weapon that the United States has, which has ensured uh, the success and prospering of American hegemony in the past. And that is to so conduct our affairs that others, in fact, do want the same things that we want. This is by no means uh, an irretrievable situation. There are things that can be fixed. There is movement in that direction. There's a lot of work still to be done, but to put not too fine a point on it, as my Yale History Department colleague Don Hagen, normally a very strong, even vociferous defender of this administration, has allowed these guys need to get tapped. And I would agree with that. So that's where we stand right now. We've witnessed the remarkably effective use of military force. And when compared to the military operations that have taken place uh, in the past, it's been a remarkably humane use of force as well, because I don't think there has ever been an example of a country this large 
uh, being uh, taken over a regime of this substance, and so that it's being proposed at uh, a less human cost than this one has. And then acknowledging for the fact that we really don't know what the Iraqi casualties have been. Uh, I'm nonetheless astonished that they have been as low, that the range has been as low as what we've seen uh, up, to this, up to this point. Um, it's easy to say that because we have had multiple motives in launching this operation, and that because all aspects of it have uh, been less, have not been perfect, that we should never have attempted it uh, in the first place. But purity in motives and perfections and perfection in operations in this world, at least, it seems to me, are beyond what we can reasonably expect. I think we will have to reserve those standards uh, for the next world. So by the standards of this world, by the standards of our own past uh, experience, uh, this situation, this strategy, this war, has gone, it seems to me, far better than most of us, certainly than I would have uh, expected. I think it represents um, the um, exemplification of a new and dramatically different grand strategy. I think it reflects the presence of far more substance and perceptiveness at high levels in Washington than many of my own academic colleagues have been willing uh, to acknowledge. I think it poses us as historians a major challenge to recognize indeed that we are in a new era, not just with respect to the threats that we confront to our national security, but to the strategies that have been uh, formulated in response to those threats. That's where we are, I think, at this point. And that's where I would like to stop and open it up for your comments. Thank you. I'll be very disappointed if there are no comments. <laughs> Um, many political theorists have talked about how um, democracy is something that kind of has to be called for by the people, that has to be something that they themselves achieve. Do you think that we have done enough in terms of facilitating, I know we've given the people of Afghanistan and Iraq the opportunity to, uh, to have a democratic government, do you feel like we've done enough to promote like a sense of legitimacy, like that they are, it's not a public government, that it's something that they are actually achieving, that they're building, or do we need to do more with that? No, the answer is of course no. Uh, not enough. Uh, we just got there. We just started. Uh, this process is not going to be complete in six weeks or in six months. This is going to be a long-term process. Anybody who tells you that we can uh, zoom in and zoom out of a place like Afghanistan and leave democracy behind us uh, is, uh, you know, like um, sparkle dust or something like that uh, from Tinkerbell he is totally wrong. This is going to be a long-term commitment. There's a big debate that's going on right now about how you do this. Um, do you do it by um, um, zooming forward to call free elections very quickly, or do you, build, do, you do this first by trying to build uh, civil society and build a set of stable institutions and some framework of law before you move into this? In short, do you do this through a period of imperial tutelage or management? And I think um, my own view is probably the latter. You do it through a period of tutelage and management. I would call to your attention uh, Farid Zakaria's uh, fine new book uh, on this. Uh, the uh, editor of Newsweek International has written very eloquently about this and is rumored to be in line to be the first Muslim Secretary of State of the United States um, to uh, pick up his argument on this, which is one that I think is well informed by history, not surprisingly, since he was a Yale uh, student a long time. But I think his argument is very persuasive in this regard. If you buy that argument, then it means we're in this uh, for a long haul. And I think that's accurate. And I think one doesn't take on responsibilities like this without going in for a long haul. Yes, sir. Could you comment about the, the exercise of democracy by Turkey voting not to support us and what this means? Well, I think that's the brakes. I think that's part of what happens when you have a democracy. It's not always going to do what you want it to do. But we reacted pretty negatively. We absolutely did, yes. And uh, we uh, were quite shocked by this uh, outcome. We recovered nicely from it in the military sense. It turned out to be less militarily damaging uh, than one thought it might have been. But surely it was a shock uh, to us. 
So one of the questions we have to wrestle with is what do we actually mean by the kind of democracy that we're trying to promote uh, in the Middle East? Uh, do we mean a democracy that's always going to do what we want it to do? Or do we mean a democracy that will be prepared in some situations or in some cases to, um, to talk back? I don't think it's a democracy unless it's the latter. I don't think it really is a democracy if all it does is to follow your own um, recommendations. When I say we should try to get others to want what we want, I don't mean that that has to, it's got to happen or can't happen in every situation. So my take on Turkey is that we should uh, put a positive spin on this. We should welcome this as an indication of a uh, particularly vigorous exercise of Turkish parliamentary democracy. We should sigh with some relief that the military consequences of it were not greater. We should acknowledge that Turkey perhaps falls into the same category as certain other democracies that lie somewhere in between us and Turkey geographically. Also, through democratic procedures, chose not to be particularly cooperative with us in a military sense. And just say that's the breaks that comes with the, the territory, and I would I would relax on this one. Yes, sir? Didn't Wolfowitz contradict himself, though, when he, when he suggested that the Turkish military should have, to the follow up on your yeah. question, should have uh, played a larger role in Turkey? Yes, I think he did, if he was, if he was accurately quoted in this. And, there's no, and he probably was. And there's no question that the administration was very frustrated by this um, outcome. But um, my sense is that with the Turkish situation, as well as with the French situation and the German situation and whatnot, the time has come to cool it. The time has come to just get beyond this, put this beyond this. Don't be cheesy and cheap and petulant about this. Um, Churchill's great uh, motto um, in the front of each of his uh, six volumes of wartime memoirs in victory magnanimity makes a, an awful lot of sense. And it seems to me we can easily afford now some magnanimity uh, with regard to this, some generosity with regard to this, uh, some tolerance for a set of, um, in some cases, uh, you can argue both ways on the Turks, but I think in some other cases, some really dumb decisions. Anyway, we can get beyond that. Yes, sir. One of the criticism or uh, one of the criticism that has been touched against against the uh, Bush administration was not so much about the strategy itself, but rather on the implementation of the strategy yeah. in the East. Now my question is specifically on the Israeli Palestinian uh, conflict and specifically on the road, but the same thing decided that one of the most uh, complicated, one of the most complicated issues now in the Middle East. Do you see uh, um, uh, uh, full implementation of the ideas uh, it has have been written uh, through the roadmap in uh, uh, in the area. I mean, uh, exerting pressure of, uh, on both uh, both sides uh, in order to uh, uh, really arrive to a some kind of agreement. Well, I hope we see pressure on both sides. <clears throat> it seems to me that the time has come to see pressure on both sides. Uh, there was no particular reason to be putting pressure on the Israelis. It seems to me, as long as you were dealing with Arafat. Um, of whom a speaker at Yale sometime the last year memorably said, some people are born incompetent, some people develop incompetence, and some people have incompetence thrust upon them, and Arafat is all three. Uh, <laughs> um, after the turning down of the Camp David uh, Agreement in 2000, uh, it seems to me that we really were powerful brands uh, not to deal with him and be to shut him aside, as was the joint American Israeli strategy. And um, that has succeeded, it seems to me, to a large extent now. Uh, that having been the case, yes, I think the time has come now to demonstrate even-handedness and uh, to uh, really uh, use our leverage, uh, both with the Israeli government and the Palestinian government, to make the concessions that everybody knows have been uh, the way to solve this problem uh, ever since the Oslo process began. We all know what the direction is of a solution. We all know the compromises that need to be made, who has to give up uh, what. Uh, there's no argument about this, and it just requires uh, the will to do it. It requires um, a heavy weight, I think, to come in and tell both sides that they have to do it at this point. It requires somebody of whom both sides can say, we were reluctant to do this, but we had to do it given the logic of the situation, and that's where the United States and its allies, if they are willing, and play a very valuable role uh, at 
this point. So yes, I think that has to happen now if we're going to be successful. And I think that's now that's an element in the strategy. I, as I say, I'm not going to predict to you whether it will happen or not. But I, my own view is that it has to happen if the strategy is going to succeed. Because this is one aspect of an overall much larger strategy. And what people fail to realize about this administration is that it actually has a strategy in which the various components relate logically to one another uh, and are, uh, are part of the larger strategy. And this roadmap for the Israeli-Palestinian peace really is part of the larger strategy. It's not just a goal uh, in and of itself. So if the larger strategy is going to succeed, yes, I think the roadmap has to succeed. Yes, sir. The strategy you're talking about, is that, is that just kind of sitting in a drawer, ready to go, waiting, you know, or, or was this sort of all thought after September 11th? Mm -hmm. Because the yeah. President Bush initially, when he was during the election, yeah. seemed to Hands off. Yeah. And now it's we're, we're deep into it. No, no way, no way it was sitting in the drawer, uh, waiting for something like September 11th to happen. The only thing that was there in the drawer was the so-called Wolfowitz Doctrine, which goes all the way back to the defense posture draft statement of 1992, in which Wolfowitz was uh, making the point that the United States should maintain strength beyond challenge. Uh, but as uh, some historian friends have pointed out to me, what's new about that, that has really been American strategy since the end of World War II. So that's more startling uh, when you say it than in fact it is when you think about it in terms of the historical uh, precedent. It is quite true that there were a few people running around before uh, mm -hmm. September 11th, uh, Richard Pearl was one, who were saying that uh, we had to take out Iraq, we had to finish the job that had not been finished in 1991. But there's no way these people would have been listened to in any significant way had it not been for September 11th. The original theme of, uh, well, the theme of the book that kind of goes with the title of tonight's lecture, the Surprise Security and uh, uh, Surprise it's, uh, <laughs> Surprise Security and the American, American experience. experience. Yes, I think I'm going to have to get a sexier title. Anyway, <laughs> um, the basic argument of the book is precisely that it has been, has been such shocks to, it has been surprise attacks themselves that have generated new strategies. And I try to make the argument in the book that it was um, really the shock of the War of 1812, and particularly of the burning of Washington, which over a period of time gave rise to uh, a coherent uh, American grand strategy in the 19th century that we associated chiefly with John Quincy Adams, who was the Secretary of State in that period. The characteristics of that strategy being, quite interestingly, preemption, unilateralism, and hegemony, hegemony on a continental scale. So these ideas are not totally new in the American experience. And then, of course, secondly, Pearl Harbor certainly gave rise to a new grand strategy, a grand strategy of multilateral uh, coalition building that made it possible for us to win World War II and to win the Cold War, conduct the Cold War along those lines. I don't think either of these would have developed as quickly or as decisively uh, had it not been for those surprise attacks. And I think surely September 11th falls into that category if it hadn't been for September 11th. Uh, we might well have percolated along with uh, very little evidence of intelligent thought being given to matters of strategy, which is how I would characterize the first six or so months of, of the Bush administration. But a shock like this forces you to think. It's like Dr. Johnson said, you know, the prospect of being hanged in a fortnight, sir, concentrates the mind wonderfully. Well, this um, attacks like this tend to produce grand strategies, so it's not too surprising that this has happened in that way. Uh, Jeremy. I remember a few years ago, John, you made the case that uh, empires tend to inspire resistance among mm -hmm. other among other states mm -hmm. that themselves can form mm -hmm. coalitions of various mm -hmm. kinds. So I wonder, uh, in your talk, what what is the protection against us inspiring a not not just local resistance, but a coalition of other states that say we we feel threatened by the United mm -hmm. States, we're mm -hmm. not going to take this. Sure. On the one hand, and on the other hand, what is to stop us from going too far? What you say makes a lot of sense for Iraq, perhaps. What about Syria? Mm -hmm. What if young Assad says, no, I'm not going to deal. Yes, I'm going to continue to develop chemical and perhaps nuclear weapons. Do we go into Syria? Uh, 
how does that change Russian and Chinese calculations? What do we do then? Well, I think this is where it's really important um, to study grand strategy um, to answer this question. Because it seems to me that, yes, obviously, the historical examples are all there. No empire has ever existed without ultimately generating self-defeating resistance. Uh, the question is, how long is it ultimately? For Rome, it was several hundred years. For the British Empire, it was several hundred years. Um, uh, how long for the American Empire? Well, this is, this is a good question. Um, so that's one issue, is simply the time scale. Secondly, there is the fact that the American Empire, if you buy my argument about American hegemony, uh, has been in place for over half a century, really, uh, since 1945. And our predominance is more visible now that there is no superpower competitor out there. And yet, the more we learn of the weakness of our superpower competitor in the Cold War, the clearer it is that even if we didn't know it, we were in a hegemonic uh, position uh, at that point. So one of the interesting questions is, why didn't this resistance arise to us during that period, as balance of power theory would have suggested it should have? One of the answers, of course, in the Cold War is that there was something worse out there, which was the Soviet Union. But then the question is, if that's the case, well, why didn't resistance to our hegemony, which became even greater once the Soviet Union disappeared from the scene, why didn't that develop? Why did we go through these 10 years or so in the 1990s of unquestioned hegemony without this resistance uh, developing. And that's a really interesting question. Um, curiously, the Bush administration has provided um, some answer to this, not in the national strategy statement, but in the very interesting commencement speech that Bush gave at West Point back in June of 2002, in which it suddenly appeared as if he had been reading some rather sophisticated history and political science, because what he said was that there may be some situations in which it is actually more convenient uh, for the rest of the world to have a hegemonic authority, because that means uh, for the rest of the world that they don't have to engage in costly arms races uh, and balance of power. And they can all sit around and cultivate their uh, farmers and coddle their labor unions and so on and so forth. And uh, this is not just Bush blowing uh, steam here. There is a respectable body, as some of you probably know, of uh, political science and political economy and literature about uh, hegemons um, existing by the consent of those who are within its system for just this reason, because it does lower costs, and it does impose rules, and it does create uh, predictability. How long this phenomenon lasts, uh, to what extent this phenomenon is happening now, uh, who is to say? I think there certainly is almost invariably, I just go ahead and say invariably, uh, the prospect that sooner or later we will go too far. Um, we have had some very interesting conversations in the grand strategy class as to whether Bush can be like Bismarck. Bismarck knew when to stop. Uh, and the question, uh, I think it's a very real question right now, is what are the limits, how far can in fact uh, we go? And I think the evidence that diplomacy is being used very vigorously with respect to Syria, with respect to Iran, with respect to North Korea right now, these are encouraging developments. They do suggest that the Bush people do not just see an indefinite set of military dominoes that they're going to be knocking over here. But again, I'm, I'm not going to make any promises on this. Because I don't want you to come back, Jeremy, some 10 or 15 or 25 or 50 years later and say, but you said back then that. So that's where I would put this. Yes, sir. Uh, John. John, I want to ask you the uh, kind of academic comment question that I personally hate. Okay. Let me make it three points. First, you dangled the C student theory out there, yep. and I figured, some, you figured somebody like me would jump, would leap for that one. Um, George Kennan, of course, as you know, is uh, rather critical of FDR in this regard. Uh, and uh, also, I remember at the time, that 1982, at the centennial of his birth, which I actually thought was very fitting that it was when Ronald Reagan was president, because I think Reagan and FDR probably were the most alike in character. Uh, Jim Burns actually uh, dissented from the widespread uh, adulation saying that he thought there was a dimension of intellect beyond that, which makes it 
truly graced mm -hmm. in, a, in a space person mm -hmm. there, so that the, we shouldn't take these people skills, C students types, uh, necessarily as our models for leadership. And I think certainly in the case of Harry Truman and maybe Eisenhower as well, I would dissent from that too. I think these men may not have been all that academically trained. I think Truman was mm -hmm. a, a genuine autodidact. Mm -hmm. Second point, uh, the quote of Truman, I believe, he said, it's not what you don't know that bothers me so much, it's the things that you're sure of that are just plain wrong. Yeah. You seem to be arguing that it's better to have a grand strategy than to have no grand strategy. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter so much that the thing may be just plain wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, I can respond to that too. Uh, the third thing is to go back to the interesting point that this young man made at the very beginning. This vision of our imposing democracy in the Middle East. Uh, I remember when I read Nick Lemon's piece in the New Yorker, was that a month, six weeks ago? Yeah. He interviewed the people just under Wolfowitz. Wits. When I finished that, I thought, going back to your comment about the student on 910, what have they been smoking? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't there the danger that we're creating a Weimar? Yeah. You know, but, but can we really do this? Mm -hmm. May we not be delegitimizing mm -hmm. the very kind of secular, pluralistic democracy that we really want to promote? Yeah. So, those are my three comments. You can do right. or, or not do those. Let, um, let me take them in reverse order. Okay. John, that's right. Uh, first of all, on the democracy thing and the dangers of that, I already talked something, I said something about that in my lecture and invoked Weimar as a, as a specific um, example. I think there's one other reason for thinking that there may be some possibility for success uh, for this movement. And this has to do with how you read the long term underlying historical tectonics. It really depends on whether you believe Fukuyama or Huntington about this. And um, overall, looking at the record of the 20th century and looking at the fact that the 20th century started out, according to the Freedom House statistics, with about two democracies and wound up with something like 120 or so, this is going to be one of my rare excursions into quantitative political science theory. Uh, I think Fukuyama holds up better. I think there was something that was going on in the 20th century which looks like a global, perhaps irreversible trend uh, toward uh, democratization. And I'm struck as he is by the number of different places where this has taken hold, not least Russia, which is along the way uh, in this direction, not least China, which looks increasingly interesting, particularly if you look at local government uh, in, in China. Not least Iran, which in itself is a fascinating example. Um, a lot of problems in Iran, but still arguably the closest thing that we have to a parliamentary system in the Middle East outside of Israel and Turkey. And that's fascinating. So I, on balance, tend to tilt more toward Fukuyama than Huntington. Forget about all the inward history stuff, which was silly, but um, what he's saying about the irreversibility of the democratic uh, tendency, I think, makes a lot more sense than Huntington's clash of civilization theory. And so it was very interesting to me that in the Bush national strategy statement, Huntington is explicitly repudiated, uh, not by name, but they are careful to say that we do not see this as a clash of civilizations, we see it as a clash within a civilization. And that's a Fukuyamaist uh, perspective, so it's interesting that the Bush administration has aligned itself with Fukuyama in this regard. And I think that's one other element in their thinking. They see their own efforts as being compatible with the long-term trend of history. And um, I think that makes the prospects of success somewhat more uh, likely than might otherwise be the case. With respect to grand strategy, is it better to have a grand strategy or not to have a grand strategy? Well, I think it's obviously better in most situations. Is it better to have a grand strategy if it's wrong than not to have a grand strategy at all, maybe. Uh, there are some arguments uh, in some situations for simply muddling through. But I think in a period of crisis, you have to have one. I don't think you can get around that. And that, indeed, is what we've been through. Um, I would not say it was an irretrievable disaster that we functioned in the 1990s without a grand strategy. We uh, maintained our position reasonably uh, well. But I think it would have been a disaster not to have one in the wake of uh, September 11th. So again, I just come back to this relationship that I've indicated before between crisis uh, and grand strategy. 
with regard to leadership, and particularly with regard to intellectual lightweights who wind up as president, I meant intellectual lightweight in the academic sense. And I used to specifically refer to our own sense as uh, what we consider intellectual lightweights and heavyweights within the academic context. But I would fully agree with what you were suggesting about FDR and Truman and Eisenhower in other ways. In other ways, they were heavyweights of the premier variety. And indeed, I would even go so just to the 19th century and Franklin D. Roosevelt, the greatest grand strategist of the 20th century. Why? Well, precisely because he had this ability to look at the entire picture and to see the relationships of it. And that's why he ran a reasonably chaotic government. That was his way of getting all of these lines of authority feeding into him because he understood the importance of psychological leadership. You could see this in uh, uh, the handling of the New Deal, and the restoration of confidence through the fireside chats, but because he understood this as well in leadership uh, as a wartime leader as well. Uh, because he could see further ahead than most other people. He saw the danger from the aggressors uh, before others did, and was trying to move the country in that direction. Because he saw even at the time of the Nazi-Soviet pact, that eventually Russia would be our ally, and it was important not to break relations uh, with that country. Because he took a flyer on uh, the atomic bomb. Uh, this was science fiction in the context of 1940-1941, uh, somebody coming in and saying that we can uh, force molecules together and we can construct a weapon that uh, put in the war. It was total science fiction. Stalin, when presented with that alternative, regarded it as science fiction and brushed it aside until he got intelligence that the Americans themselves were doing. FDR made the decision to go with it. A far more radical decision than what Ronald Reagan did with uh, Star Wars in 1983, and one that paid off, uh, again, in extraordinary terms uh, for the United States. And you can go down the list. The Germany first strategy at a time when the pressure was to go after Japan uh, first, uh, the importance of uh, coalitions. The body count, the fact that we fought uh, two great wars at opposite sides of the earth, brought them to roughly simultaneous conclusions uh, with remarkably few casualties, uh, depending on how you calculate it, somewhere between 300 and 400,000 uh, killed, a remarkably low number compared to what the other belligerents uh, in the war suffered, uh, something like um, the Russians suffered something like 60 times the casualties that we did. Or these things did not happen just by accident. They happened as a result of having somebody in charge who knew what he was doing. And I'm very fond of this um, statement that AJP Taylor uh, buried at about in a footnote in about page 508 of his English history in 1914 1945. Look at this uh, page, you'll see Taylor saying, AJP Taylor, the great pyrotechnic uh, historian, saying that of of all the big three, Franklin D. Roosevelt was the only one who knew what he was doing. He made the United States the greatest power in the world at virtually no cost. And I think increasingly historians are coming around to that, that view. So I was talking about a different kind of weightiness. Uh, it's not the kind that's taught in classrooms uh, for the time uh, very often, although we're making some effort to teach it now uh, at Yale. Uh, but uh, it's, um, it's very important. And it does raise really interesting questions, it seems to me, about who you want to have as your chief brand strategist. Would I want to have George Cannon as my chief brand strategist? No way. Um, he was great for coming up with a concept containment at that time. But for running a government, the temperament to run a government, temperament to see all of these things and to keep them in balance, no way. So I think it does take a certain kind of leadership. And this has been a very interesting experience with um, Bush the Younger, just as it was with Reagan, whose role is significantly being reassessed now by historians and who increasingly is being taken seriously as a certain foreign policy and strategy as one of the most successful presidents of the 20th century. A little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would love to learn uh, your comments on China. The rise of China has been a great topic uh, in the last mm -hmm. decade. And uh, first of all, how do you view the rise of China, whether it be a threat to the United States or to the world, or whether it be just a play as a state physical power? This is number one. My number two question is that, how do you view that uh, Bush administration's policy to China? Yeah. Because 
before 9-11, uh, Bush administration to China is so-called um, strategic competitive. But after 9-11, it seems to change. Sure. China become a cooperative or constructive and uh, candid uh, partner in right. world affairs. Uh -huh. So if there is no 9-11, and if Bush uh, continue his uh, strategic competitor strategy to China, how do you view this? Right. Do you think that's the right strategy? Well, first of all, I view the rise of China as something that has happened before. And over the last four to 5,000 years, China has risen and fallen. And this is yet one more in a very long sequence of Chinese rises and falls. So in that sense, it certainly should not surprise anybody who's got a long-term view of history. Does it pose a threat uh, to the United States? I don't think so, and never have thought so, uh, because it seems to me that part of this Chinese rise that's taking place is happening as a result of a profound change that is taking place within China. Uh, China has accomplished something which is really quite remarkable. It's the first time that a communist state has actually become a thriving capitalist uh, enterprise. Uh, and yet this is what has taken place. Uh, particularly now ideologically sanctioned with Yang Shimon's uh, three represents. This is a remarkable intellectual achievement uh, for communism to achieve capitalism in this way. This is uh, quite a breakthrough. So that's a big change. Uh, secondly, it seems to me that the nature of Chinese society is changing uh, as well, as you're perfectly aware. I mean, the, 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 uh, first of all, the rise of prosperity, the fact that China can now largely feed itself and that its uh, population has pro prospered, not everywhere and not evenly, but to the extent that it has. This is a revolutionary development uh, in, in world history. Uh, secondly, the extent to which China has been integrated into the global economy with uh, the membership in WTO. Uh, again. So it seems to me that all of these are positive indications that uh, the United States should certainly uh, welcome. I think it would be a very bad model for the United States to interpret uh, hegemonic authority as one in which uh, there are no smaller hegemons around. I think that regional hegemons acting cooperatively with the United States. It is a strong European Union, a strong Russia, a strong China, uh, really probably is the most viable model uh, for the future. If for no other reason than as a safeguard against some of the dangers that Jeremy was mentioning about American uh, overextension. Um, so I think all of these are positive uh, indicators. Uh, you may wonder about the, the Taiwan question and how is that going to be resolved. Well, I think it will be resolved by China following the model of Taiwan. A small island will actually become the model for a larger continent. And that's kind of interesting because the Bush administration is thinking along the same lines about Israel, that a small democracy actually becomes the model for a larger continent in this regard. So that's an interesting uh, development uh, as well. Uh, has the Bush administration changed its view on China? You bet. They came into power, uh, you're right, uh, with the uh, perception that uh, China was um, becoming a threat. I think there was no particular evidence for that, but administrations quite often come into power with the sense that they've got to have a threat. Just like they've got to have a Secretary of Defense, and they've got to have a Secretary of State, and they've got to have some threat out there that they can plan against. And I think without very much intelligent thought, China was thrust into that uh, category because Russia just did not seem credible in that regard, in that context. But as they were forced to get their act together in the aftermath of 9 11, I think all of that has been rethought, and China is now viewed as a valued ally in the war against terrorism as an important ally in the problem of dealing with uh, North Korea. And uh, the relationship, as you know, is, is much smoother now. So yes, I think there has been uh, just a, a coming around to good sense on this part, uh, on this issue, on the part of the administration. Yes, in back. Rick. Is, is what you're suggesting kind of the son of a modernized suit up during the balance of power? Um, I don't think it's quite balance of power, because balance of power implied uh, states of roughly equal strength balancing each other. And that's not what's in the cards here. What's in the cards is a situation where you've got one disproportionately powerful state. And then you will have other sub-hegemons, as I was saying a while ago. There will be some balancing 
in that. There's no question. I think there should be some balance in for the reasons that I mentioned. But I think that's going to be combined with um, hegemonic management of the international system. Um, and uh, that may not be a bad model to follow because we know that balance of power systems have fallen apart and have produced force uh, in the past. Some combination of a balance of power system together with some kind of hegemonic uh, authority. Particularly if that hegemonic authority can act with uh, multilateral consent and makes an effort to act with multilateral uh, consent. Um, maybe even the United Nations consent and support uh, in due course. That could turn out not to be a bad model for uh, how to run the international system. So I would see some combination thereof, but not the old classical balance of power. Uh, yes. Um, you talked a little bit uh, earlier about France and Germany as kind of the, um, opponents to the United States, more recently ideologically regarding the war in Iraq. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you kind of toss those aside as just kind of, well, that's just France and Germany. That's just how, how they believe in kind of all those kind of classic American prejudices about about Europe. But at the same time, the coalition of the willing. You know, you have the Bush administration going out and publicly saying that we're great allies with you know, Yugoslavia and Romania and Micronesia and all these countries that really, when it comes down to it, don't project anywhere near the kind of power that, that European Union does. So do you see um, the war in Iraq kind of as a general trend in the United States operating outside of the international system? And if so, what does that mean to I increasingly well, first of all, I would um, ask you what you meant when you said that the European Union projects significant military power. I haven't seen it yet. They're talking about it, but I don't think it exists yet. Uh, so that's that's one problem. Um, if you rephrase that question and say, is the United States uh, preparing to act outside of the NATO framework? Well, not quite, because NATO is being expanded to include a fair number of these countries. But I think in another sense, we will be acting outside the NATO uh, framework. I think, yes, the geopolitical cards are being reshuffled. There's no question about it. And that's one of the things that really is interesting about this uh, period. If you were to again go back to uh, my uh, student on September 10th, uh, 2001, whispering in your ear, and that student would tell you that we would have air bases in uh, Uzbekistan, for example, and Afghanistan, uh, and Iraq, and that we would be pulling out of Saudi Arabia. All of these things. There's a major reconfiguration of American military bases that is taking place. And some of that is going to involve a lowered profile in some of the countries where we traditionally had such bases, like Germany. Uh, we are going to have bases in Poland or in Ukraine or elsewhere. This will happen for the most part with the consent of the Russians. This is something else that I think nobody would have believed even five years ago. But again, September 11th has dramatically changed uh, that situation. So, uh, yeah, I think it's quite a new ballgame in terms of the realignment of strategic uh, positions uh, in the world with, with withdrawal from Saudi and very likely from Germany uh, uh, as well. Um, and um, what does that suggest then about the future of our relationship with our European allies? Well, uh, I don't know. I'm on a new uh, task force at the Council on Foreign Relations that's being chaired by Henry Kissinger and uh, Larry Summers, the president of Harvard. We had our first meeting on Monday. We talked about that. And in a kind of usual Council on Foreign Relations way, we came to certain astounding conclusions, such, are, such as that the Cold War is over, <laughs> and that the end of the Cold War has created a new framework for the transatlantic relationship. That there are significant problems in the transatlantic relationship, which must be carefully thought about for the future. And that pretty well filled the afternoon right there. <laughs> so how far, how much further we go with this, I don't know. But it's a new ballgame. That's the real answer to the question. Yes. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, Ed. Could you speak to um, Indonesia? And, <laughs> I, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Directly. Okay. Uh, I see uh, that the possible monster and a federal government, uh, yeah. terrorism, the largest Muslim sure. population in the world, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. anecdotal. But arguably also a democracy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if America's focus will uh, be in 
that direction eventually will need to be in that direction. Well, I hope America's focus will be in several directions in that part of the world. I mean, I think it ought to be on Indonesia for the reasons that um, you suggested, that we actually do have a functioning Muslim democracy there, not an Arab democracy, but Muslim democracy. We also have one in India. A lot of people forget that, uh, for the statistic, Jeremy is India the largest functioning Muslim democracy, or close to it, or something like that. Well, if you, if you count Indonesia as a democracy, yeah. Indonesia okay. would be larger. Okay, but, but India would be the largest functioning democracy by population. Sure, and with a very large Muslim population, in the West, uh, as part of it, uh, as well. And uh, it seems to me it's really very important that we focus on these big countries uh, in that part of the world. These are, as Kennedy is fond of saying, the pivotal states. Um, and uh, they deserve more attention than we've given them uh, over the years. I think that's happening. I think that this administration does have the capacity to think in terms of relationships among great powers. This is not widely advertised, but I see it there. I think it contrasts uh, with the Clinton policy, which was quite often and quite legitimately focused on justice for small powers, but often allowed relations with big powers to erode in the pursuit of justice for small powers. And I think this administration is tilting back in the other direction. So I see the improvement in the relationship with India as already part of the strategy. And it seems to me that that is likely to happen is to some extent happening with Indonesia uh, as well. Uh, yes? Yeah, we talked about uh, you know, Iraq's eventual democracy and Israel serving as examples for countries like Syria. But what's to serve as an example for a country like North Korea? <laughs> That's a really good question. Maybe South Korea. On the one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think um, the North Korean situation, I mean, who, you, you'd really be foolish to try to predict the outcome of that. Situation. The um, whole history of the Korean Peninsula is just littered with failed predictions, uh, going all the way back to the outbreak of the Korean War and before. Um, but uh, if you ask me, is the North Korean regime of Kim Jong il uh, likely to be there in the same way that it is now, 10 years from now? I think it's highly unlikely. I can't tell you how the change is going to come, uh, but I think that change will come is uh, extraordinarily likely. Uh, now, of course, you have to remember that I was saying exactly the same thing about North Korea 10 years ago, just as I was saying the same thing about 10 years ago. But um, I think that uh, what's interesting about the current situation is the number of states who are neighbors of North Korea who have come to the view that the existing situation cannot be allowed to continue. That's what's new in this situation, getting the Chinese and the Russians and the Japanese <coughs> and the South Koreans all pretty much lined up. Uh, and as we get more and more bluster out of North Korea, and as evidence mounts that they really are serious about processing plutonium or developing weapons or exporting weapons, I think it's only likely to see that pressure increase because none of these neighbors have the slightest interest in seeing that happen. And I think that's the new situation that's, that's developing. That, uh, and, and that creates a new dynamic for how long North Korea can sustain these policies. I think we should take one more question. Uh, I've tried to wear John Gaddis down today, and once again, he's proven to me that I can't wear him down. We have a seminar this afternoon that went on for three hours, and now we've had uh, more than an hour and a half. Okay, should we take that? Back? Andy? All right, I'll, I'll try to ask a question that links up. Uh, um, starting with uh, strategies of containment, which is the book of yours that I just recently read. Yeah. Um, we talked about George Tennant.